Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to the third of four webinars in UCI Division of Continuing Education's 10th Annual Web GATE Webinar Series. Today's topic is Depth and Complexity Prompts. What do I do with these? This session is being recorded and the archive will be posted to the UCI DCE On Demand Recordings page. Additionally, if you did register through our free events website, I will be emailing out a recording link for the webinar um, later on this week. So keep an eye out in your inbox for that email. My name is Lisa Huang and I'm a program manager here at UCI DCE. Below is a brief overview of what we are going to cover in this webinar session. First, I'll start off with a quick overview of Zoom features so you'll know how to submit questions to our featured speaker throughout the presentation. Next, I will provide you with information about several GATE resources offered through UCI Division of Continuing Education, including our fully online GATE Specialized Studies program. I will cover the requirements, fees, and some upcoming courses for our spring quarter, which begins on April 2nd. I will then hand it over to Krista Landgraf as she will be presenting on today's topic, Depth and Complexity Prompts. At the end of her presentation, we will have a brief Q&A session. And finally, I'll leave you with my contact information so that you can send us any additional questions that we didn't address. If you encounter any technical difficulties during the webinar today, please send a chat message directly to John from UCI Support, and he will help you troubleshoot any issues. If you have a question for Krista regarding the content of this presentation, please feel free to submit it in the chat panel, and we will address it at the end if we have time. And you do wanna make sure that you do send your questions to all panelists, and that'll ensure that both Krista and myself see your question come in. Here's a brief overview of our GATE Specialized Studies program. It is offered fully online and it consists of three required courses and three elective units. Our program is taught by a team of experienced instructors and is designed for individuals new to the field as well as current GATE educators seeking professional development opportunities. To be eligible for the GATE certificate, students must complete all nine units with a letter grade of C or better, as well as a completed request for certificate. The courses in the program range from $375 to $500 per course, depending on the unit value, and you may take individual courses without pursuing the entire program. Here's a list of the required and elective courses that make up our GATE program. The topics covered in the program will help you develop a new skill set and gain a deeper understanding of this diverse group of students. When viewing the course schedule online, you'll notice that not all classes are offered every quarter, so you will want to plan accordingly. And you'll want to pay close attention to the unit value of each course because this dictates the course fee and how long each course will last. So for example, you can expect Learning Styles, which is a one unit course to cost $375 and last three weeks online, while Differentiating Instruction, which is a three unit course, costs $500 and lasts 10 weeks online. And the nice thing about our program is that you can earn your certificate in as little as nine months, and you can choose the elective topics that are of greatest interest to you. Here's a list of the courses that we are offering in the upcoming spring quarter for the required course, Differentiated Instruction, and for the elective courses, Learning Styles and Engaging Students Through Technology. Each course is listed with its start and end date, as well as the online course fee. The course schedule and enrollment information are also posted on our website. <clears throat> Enro enrollment is currently open and students may enroll either online or by calling our student services office at the number provided. And we do encourage students to enroll at least two weeks prior to the start of a course. This slide here has a special offer that we are offering all of you who are logged into this webinar to receive a 10% discount on online courses in our GATE Specialized Studies program during the upcoming spring quarter. Please feel free to use the discount promo code GATE10. Either when registering online, you'll just wanna make sure to enter that discount code in the field, or you can also mention the discount code when if you're calling our student services office to enroll over the phone. And this discount offer does expire on April 30th. As you may already know, UCI DCE hosts an online GATE community that is free and open to the public. Please follow the directions on this slide to become a member and you will gain access to valuable resources, news, and events regarding GATE. And recordings of all of our past webinars are also available through the community. 
We also provide individual courses, specialized in services, and the entire GATE program on site or online to schools and districts at reduced prices. Depending on the cohort size, we offer 10, 15, or 20% off course fees. So if you'd like to learn more about our program and discuss your GATE training and PD needs, feel free to contact me at the address listed on this slide. We are offering a credit option for those of you who plan on attending all of the live webinars in this 10th annual series. In order to receive one unit of credit, individuals must attend all four live webinars, totaling the four hours, submit an official enrollment form with payment, and turn in a reflection paper plus lesson plan. You can email me again at the address listed here for the official enrollment form and requirements. All right, to wrap up my portion of the presentation, hopefully you saw some courses that piqued your interest and we hope you will consider adding our fully online GATE program to your credentials. This slide has my contact information as well as my directors, so please feel free to contact us with any additional questions that you may have. Today's presenter is Krista Landgraf, GATE Program Specialist for Orange County Department of Education. She previously taught GATE students in third, fifth, and sixth grades in the Chino Valley Unified School District for 20 years. She serves on the California Association for the Gifted Executive Board as the parent rep chair for the state. And we're very excited to have her logged in today to present on the topic depth and complexity prompts. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Krista so that she can further introduce herself and also um, begin her portion of the presentation. Krista, are you there? Yes, I'm here, okay. Wonderful, take it away. All right, great. Well, welcome to all of you that are out there. Um, I'm excited to talk to you about the depth and complexity prompts. Um, I'm assuming um, that most of you know what they are or have seen them before. So we'll go from there. Except for my slides not moving, there it goes. Okay, so one of the big questions that people have is they may have seen these in the past and uh, wait. Um, seen them in the past and not really sure how they're supposed to utilize them in a classroom situation. And I'm still, I, my slide is skipped on me. Did you want to go back one slide? I think yeah, that's where and it I've lost started. Control of it. It's it's not there anymore. Um, let me. No, my screen. I just have the chat box at the bottom. It won't go away. Let me let me take back control real quick. Okay, thanks. Hold on, let me. The excitement of technology, ladies <laughs> and gentlemen. <laughs> Are you seeing the slides on your screen now? I have the slides, but I don't have. Um, I don't seem to have control. Oh yeah. Okay, hold on. I just okay. wanted to make sure you saw the slides. Okay. Now, yeah. I'll, now yeah. I'll give you back control. There you go. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. So. so now you should um, be able to. Now we're starting over again, so welcome. <laughs> um, how do you apply these things to the classroom and what are you supposed to be doing with them? Um, if you look at them as the fact that these are really prompts of thinking, um, how does one go about thinking? One way they're gonna be doing it is through the, the um, essences of the, the prompts themselves. They were designed by Dr. Kaplan and um, Dr. Sandra Gould in a Javits grant that they did a few years ago of trying to see how students think and how we can go more deeply and more complexly into content. And I'm still not being able to move to the next slide is my problem. You should be able to click on those arrows at the yeah, bottom of the slide. Yeah, nothing's happening. But I don't have, I don't have the arrow there showing. There you go, um, there you go. Now go down a little bit and click on that arrow button. I see your mouse. I moving. don't see I don't see an arrow button. I just see just black. Hmm. John, do you want to pop on? Yeah. Oh, you can also press I think you can also press the space bar. Yeah, try this. I was trying that too and it wouldn't oh. work either. So, okay. Now it's moving. Um, okay. If you press the space bar. There you go. It moved. Okay, it's just a slow move. All right. So, these are the prompts that represent going deeper into the content. Um, I'm hoping that most of you recognize the ones that are colorized. Those are the initial uh, gate prompts. The new ones um, in the black and white may be something that some of you have not seen. For example, the first slide of the flower is actually looking at details of information. The one next to it has a series that looks like arrows moving into it. That's 
process, understanding that things, some things come in a sequence, a first, a next, a last kind of situation. Um, the next slide is your unanswered questions, things that are unanswerable that students are still pondering about or that science is still pondering about. Um, the one following next to that one is your proof. What proof do you have, which is one of the newer ones. Then we go on into the big idea. The one next to the big idea is one I particularly like a lot. It's one of the new prompts and it's looking at impacts. Um, below on the next row, the one that looks like gears is motive, which is also one of the newer prompts. Then we move over to the rules, the trends, the ethics, the language of the discipline, and the patterns. So understanding that you have those and how you work with them is one thing. Um, we're looking at the complexity. This is not, now you're not going necessarily down farther into the material, but you're stressed stretching across information. You're making comparisons to other things. You're looking at how something views from multiple perspectives, which is the first slide. The one next to it that has the straight lines and then the square is one of the new ones called translate. Um, if you ever hear Dr. Kaplan speak about it, translate, she refers to um, the, an idea of the game of telephone. How have things translated over time? What are we hearing that's not quite the same as it was to begin with? So understanding that there is a translation in, in things. Um, the next one, the arrows, is changes over time. Off to the side that's by itself with those three circles, looks kind of like a triple Venn diagram, is actually context, which is a new one. And what context and what setting and what uh, situation do things happen? Does that make a change? Um, moving back over to the left-hand side, the uh, one in color right there is across different disciplines of study. This is something that we tend to get away from in our teaching. We teach in compartments. We teach math. We teach science. We teach language arts, but we don't necessarily make those connections to students. Um, really letting them know that math is in everything that we're doing, not just in the hour block of time that I'm teaching mathematics. The one next to it with a question mark is a new one, and it's called judgment, allowing students to understand that judgments are being made. Um, the one next to that is original, and the idea of are things original? Is anything original? Um, the thinking tools, which you'll notice I'm calling them that instead of the prompts, are really the idea of this is how we think. How does one go about critically look at information? You're really going to do that as you look through each of the different prompts. So I always told my students the prompts are really metacognitive. This is knowing how I think. Um, same as how do I do a math problem? I have certain steps. If I'm thinking critically, and I want to look at things, I'm really going to analyze all the prompts in order to do that. Um, so this, again, is in a nutshell how I'm, what I'm referring to. You can start off, I can look at the details of something, but those details can lead me to an understanding of a big idea. That same big idea could look differently but depending on what perspective I'm looking at to use it. Patterns and trends can lead me to an understanding of what rules are. Changes over time can affect one's understanding of a character in a story. And paying attention to a motive can help when looking at an overall impact of whatever it is. So really, if you stop and think about how I think, I think through all of these props. Teaching students that specifically um, helps to embed in their thinking when they go about try to problem solve. What do I have to do to problem solve? Oh yeah, I need to look at details. Those details could lead me to the rules. They could lead me to a pattern which makes more understanding and so forth. So these are just a means to differentiate within your classroom. Um, they also address the four areas of our gate standards. And they're basically just what I consider good teaching. And this is teaching for all students, not necessarily something that's separate just for the gifted students. It's for everybody. Uh, gifted students need it more, but everybody benefits. So our gate standards, there are four standards in the state of California. We're looking at areas of acceleration, and it's acceleration, not necessarily of acceleration from one grade level to another, but rather acceleration of what I know, of my understanding of a situation of content. Um, depth is saying that we are going to go into more detail. We're going to look at things from the complex to the simple, 
from a part to a whole, from abstract to concrete complex, which is what a lot of our gate students do instinctively anyway, but, but pointing those things out. We're looking at complexity, which involves moving along um, a different level of understanding. You're, you're now talking to analyze, looking at inferential information. So you're getting into higher levels of blooms in this area. Novelty to me is one of the most powerful areas that we can, we can keep our students in because within novelty and you're able to look at uh, getting the students to where they want to learn about something for their own sake. So it's really learning to learn um, that idea of an independent study because I'm interested in wanting to learn. How does this affect within our uh, depth and complexity? Where does this fit into it? If you look, I've broken it down to areas within gate strategies that you can utilize. Um, gate strategies for acceleration can be anything like thinking like a disciplinarian, which is one strategy. The idea of bringing in a universal concept, which is also something that we bring in in gifted strategies, to looking at what ultimately is the big idea. In depth, that's literally going through all the prompts that cover the areas of depth. Complexity, all the prompts that cover the areas of complexity, and I've got them written out there for you. And then novelty is your critical thinking, your problem solving, your independent study areas. So these are ways that we can incorporate, hit all the gate standards using our prompts of depth and complexity. Um, as to which pathway, how you go about doing this, this is one thing that's um, up to the teacher. You have the ability to manipulate however you want the curriculum, whether you want to do the strategies, thinking like a discipline, universal concepts, things like that. If you're not familiar with any of those, then just familiarizing yourself with the depth and complexity prompts within your classroom will do a lot for your students. So the ability to go deeper into the content, some examples to give you, um, if you're looking at the impact of patterns on an idea, the new prompts by themselves are wonderful. You could look at impact, you could look at proof, you could look at how to translate information, but it's, it's a deeper, richer, more rigorous curriculum if you're asking them to, to use the new prompts embedded with the older ones. For examples that I have here, you're looking at the impact of patterns on an idea. So now you're asking them to do double, double thinking here. What's the impact of a motive? You have to analyze what the motive is to begin with and then look at the impact, the ramifications of that. Um, the next one, you're looking at a proof of an original idea and how the impact it has on an individual, which can be a tricky one because what's an original idea? So there you're grappling with multiple areas of rigor. More examples from different areas in the disciplines. Um, in language arts, for example, you could be asking your students to identify the patterns in an author's use of language, the specific language of the discipline. What patterns do they notice that the author is using? Um, and this could, you could even extend this to Identify the patterns that you see in the author's use of particular language and what proof do you have? Forcing them to go back into the text and actually show you where they're seeing the situations. Analyze how a character changes over time. And again, you could analyze how a character changes over time. What impact does that have on the story in general? What proof do you have? As you notice, the more I add areas of depth and complexity using the prompt language, the more what I'm asking my students to do is at a more rigorous level. Um, investigate the rules and processes a poet follows when creating a poem. And again, you could back that up with justification saying, prove to me where you see this. Um, and even within, if I'm looking at the rules and a process that a poet is doing in creating a poem, I'm really asking my students to look at details, break that poem apart into its elements. Um, the last one, what impact does this have on the big idea of a poem? Again, if you're, if you're understanding the, the nuances that you can keep adding layers of layers of complexity by utilizing the props. 
in math, the same thing applies. Mathematically, we're looking at, obviously, we look at rules in math. We look at patterns in math. But really stopping and letting the students understand that you have to learn the rules of this in order to understand the order of operations. And within those rules, there's a particular language that's a language specific to mathematics, the language of the discipline. Um, study the patterns of multiplying by fractions and decimals. You could study the patterns. You could look at the details of the patterns. You could look at the impact that these particular fractions and decimals have. Um, the, Next one, how can you translate algebra to a real world situation? Letting them know that algebra is not just something that we do in math class, but it actually does have real world ramifications, making students aware of that and bringing it to their attention. Um, what impacts do numbers have in your life? And there's quite a few. If you think about letting students make the relationship between numbers, again, across all disciplines, all areas, we don't just talk about math during math time, but all day you're dealing with numbers in some form or another. In social studies and science too, you can look at the prompts into your content. In social studies, you're going to be asking students to analyze the different points of view of a historical event with a particular context of the events in mind. You could just ask the students to analyze a historical event, but by twisting it now and saying, I want you to look at multiple perspectives. Look at the information that you can gather that way. Um, in social studies, when I was a fifth grade teacher, we taught the American Revolution. And I would always have my students refer back to what is the perspective of the British in terms of what was happening in the colonies at that time. Um, it wasn't something that was written in the textbook. It was something that they had to read into, analyze, synthesize the information, and spit it out. So it's much higher level of what I was asking them to do. Um, investigate how a civilization changes over time, and how do these changes make an impact? Um, you could even stretch that to investigate how a civiliza civilization changes over time, um, looking at ethics, if the ethics are changing over time, are they still present, whatever situations were going on. Um, well, and then the, the next one has ethics and it's a determining the ethical choices a ruler had to make. And again, you could do determine the ethical choices and what proof do you have. Science, again, looking at the prompts within your field of science, you're, you're looking at rules when you look at science. So examining the rules that allow a plant to grow. Um, what proof do you have that those rules exist? You could say, is there a pattern that's reoccurring as you study? Um, what are the unanswered questions of ultraviolet light? And if you have unanswered questions in an area, that could be a great opportunity to tie that into some kind of a learning opportunity for a gifted student to do an independent study. Still dealing with the content, but going at it from a different way that's not necessarily within your text. Um, identify the pattern, the different points of view and the motives of nuclear power. Um, again, the different perspectives of nuclear power, pros, cons, however you want to look at it, what motivates, what's the impact on that as well. So hopefully these give you a little idea of how you can interact in a daily conversation with your students in subject matter specific. Um, to me, what, what I'd like you to get out of this whole presentation is the fact that we need to be talking in terms of depth and complexity in all areas, all the time, every day with our students. The more we're able to do that for them, the more they'll begin to internalize and start thinking this way on their own without the benefit of your teacher standing in front of them saying these things or looking at the pictures. Um, and how do you really begin all this? One of the best ways to ensure that you're actually utilizing depth and complexity in your classroom and doing it on a consistent basis is to go directly to your standard. If you look at your standard and see ways that you could add to, um, extend, uh, highlight it, this is a great area. If you have it at the very beginning of your lesson, then you know you're going to guarantee it's going to trickle down throughout everything that you're doing. So this is why I like to steer people to look at your standard itself. How can you enhance it? How can you make it better?
the California Association of the Gifted. Oh, here's my cute little way. If I could sing a song, I'd sing, you know, let's start at the very beginning, but I won't do that to you. <laughs> um, but again, it's just starting at the beginning, looking at, this is the page I wanted to open up. Um, the California Association of the Gifted a few years ago, when the Common Core Standards first came out, decided to put together a, a what we called a white document, white paper, on uh, the Common Core and depth and complexity. So Dr. Kaplan and various members of the um, association got together and looked at the eight anchor standards that we have for reading, how they're written as they are originally, how they can be enhanced, um, highlighted, improved within usage of the depth and complexity prompts. This document, it's like 75 pages, I think, or something. It, it can be found on any of those websites I have up there. If you go to the California Association of the Gifted website, or you go to the California Department of Education website, it's also located there. But it's a nice way of showing you how you can look at a standard and highlight it. For example, on this page, if you look where it says the original standard, that's how it's written which most of our standards, if you think about it, they do have rigor embedded in them, but just because they have rigor doesn't mean it's necessarily rigorous enough. So how can I tweak it for my class, for my students? So if you look at the first, just read closely to determine what the text says explicitly and to make logical inferences from it. Cite evidence, um, cite specific textual evidence, yada 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 look at the next part where it's highlighted and where it's highlighted as you'll see it in the red so now instead of just citing evidence we're focusing on what they're citing so now i want you to cite patterns and trends as textual evidence write or speak your conclusion from the point of view of a literary critic by by saying point of view and tying it in, into a literary critic, now we're elevating into the area of acceleration. Acceleration is that thinking like a disciplinarian. So now I want you to look at this information from a disciplinarian's point of view of a literary critic, and then consider a set of factual, analytical, or evaluative questions. So again, we're saying, we're asking the kids to do the same thing, but how we're asking them to do it is layering that extra added rigor in there of the depth and complexity props. This document is there for anybody if you'd like to use it. It's just an example of how to. It is not the only way by any means, um, but it's, it is there for um, people to utilize. What I like to do is go into my own standards. So these are some sixth grade standards that I did as a sixth grade teacher of how to enhance what I had to teach. So my one of my standards as a sixth grade teacher was what's in the center of this oval shape. It was to delineate and evaluate the argument. That's what the Common Core was asking me to do. I wanted to make sure that I was giving it higher level of attention for my students. So I wanted my students to look at the impact and to be able to translate information. So I knew right away I wanted to incorporate those two prompts into my standard. So how did I do that? I ended up rewriting, re so this, is, this was from my science unit, actually. Um, global warming has a direct impact on our agriculture. Global warming was a chapter within the unit that we were studying. So here's my argument. I'm delineating my argument. How am I going to do that? For the impact, I'm asking my students to look at what are the various influences of global warming on our food source? What are the effects? And to translate, what multiple implications can you associate with agriculture and global warming? How can it be interpreted in different ways? So here's my standard at the beginning of the lesson. As I continue to teach my lesson, I know I'm going to be concentrating on impacts and translations. Within the lesson, I'll probably be adding more depth and complexity prompts as I go along. But at least if it's at the beginning, if it's at my standard, I know the rest of my lesson is going to be guaranteed that those prompts are going to be addressed. Another way um, of looking at it, um, this is obviously um, reading for informational text 6.5. The first paragraph is as the text is written in the content standard. The second is how I rewrote it. Um, so what I have to teach my students was to analyze how a particular sentence, paragraph, or chapter, or section fits into the overall structure. 
of a text, um, that's great. That's lofty. But what I really wanted them to understand was what I wrote. So I want them to know that they need to analyze the impact of how a particular sentence, paragraph, chapter, or section fits into the big ideas of the structure of a text and contribute to the process of the development of idea or ideas. I want my students to understand that every word on a page that an author puts down is done for a reason. There, there's a reason they put the punctuation that they did. There's a reason they have the paragraph structure the way they, they did. So all of that to make sure that my students understand that if I write it into my original standard, then as I teach this, I'm teaching with a, with an, a focus on the impact, the big idea, and the process that's in, inherent in writing. So this way, it also it elevates the fact that I know I'm going to be continuing with the prompts throughout my lessons. Um, these are some examples uh, from a class that I've taught on um, teaching how to write a, a task statement. So a task statement would be asking you to look at um, how I'm going to teach something, the content imperative or the depth and complexity that I want to utilize, the content itself, the resources a student would use, and what product are they going to come up with. So these are just a couple examples of really, again, this would be the, the objective for the teacher of what their lesson is going to be. So for first grade, this was students will compare and contrast, which is your learning skill, the contributions of the details of the experiences of the characters that they will read in two different stories and produce a Venn diagram to illustrate their understanding. So again, if we as teachers make a cognitive effort to insert the depth and complexity in our initial lessons, it's going to help guarantee that it gets out to the students. This is an example of what my social studies TE looked like, and I'm sorry, it's kind of blurry. Um, but when I first started grappling with depth and complexity prompts, I could think of things when I was reading the chapter, but not necessarily when I was discussing with my students. So I got smart and figured out if I put post-it notes everywhere that I saw a depth and complexity prompt would be appropriate or a question that I could ask my students that had depth and complexity in it, I went ahead and just start posting them all over my text. So pretty much all my TEs look like this. This is a great way when you're first starting off and you're like, I'm not really sure how I'm going to talk to my students about this. It's basically front loading for yourself. So I put all those things out there. And what I discovered as I was talking to my students in a particular prompt that I wanted to use, my students would come back and say, well, why didn't you talk about this one? Or why didn't you use this? Because they're seeing it from a different lens and getting different information, which to me was a lot more powerful. It shows that one, that they, they understand the prompts and use them with regularity. So this is just a suggestion on one way to start incorporating the prompts in an easy format for you. Um, this again is how I would do my teaching. Um, you can buy the magnets and you'll see the magnets that are on the board, the small ones, the big ones, or the new ones. They're not going to be for sale per se. Um, the small ones you can get, I know Jay Taylor sells them, uh, jtaylereducation.com. They're great. You can make them yourself, which is what I started to do before they had the magnets. I would just take the image of the prompt with the verbiage. So it's the academic language along with the picture. Make it a size that was small enough but big enough to be on my whiteboard that I can manipulate. I find that the cards that are out there that show the depth of complexity prompts, because they're stagnant, I don't tend to use them as often. The whiteboard uh, magnets were manipulative so I could move them around as the day progressed. So this is an example of a sixth grade lesson prior to reading. So I would front load my students before they read a section what they were going to be looking for specifically. This guaranteed that my conversation afterwards was at a much higher level. So from the very beginning, I told them in this, they had to look at multiple perspective viewpoints um, of how has the revival of family life changed over time and what, if any, unanswered questions do you have? So as they're reading the material, they're reading it looking specifically for multiple perspectives and changes over time and anything that they still are uncertain of. So anytime I did 
any of my reading, I would front load like this. So my conversations were of higher quality. Um, another thing that I do a lot and I love, but I realize a frame is a wonderful vehicle. It's really just a graphic organizer, but it's done in such a way that I found very user friendly as a teacher, something that I could do quickly and readily, um, and something that the kids were able to do at, and at any grade level. Um, so a frame, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, is literally, it looks like a picture frame in the center where you would have a picture. Um, is where you're framing your idea, your standard, your content, whatever you want them to, to discuss. The outside of the frame is how you want them to look at the information. So I've got some examples here. Um, the first one was a social studies and a student, and these are both sixth grade examples. So it was the uh, technology, I think, of Mesopotamia is what they were looking for. So in the middle, of the frame is what they were doing. And this is of an archaeologist. So these students were actually looking at it from the lens of a disciplinarian. They were archaeologists looking at information from Mesopotamia. And if you look in each corner of the frame, they're addressing a different area. So the one at the top, they were looking at what was an original idea here. Um, to the right, were what were the details? On the bottom, looking at the impact, and on the left-hand side was the rules. A lot of the information that they're asked to look for and uh, respond to is not something that they can just regurgitate. I found it on page three, um, done with the answer. This is really where they have to go into a text, read the text, analyze it, and be able to spit out information. So it's, it's asking a lot of higher level information of students. Um, the second one was denotation and connotation. This was something that I did just did kind of on the fly because it was denotation and connotation. I'm teaching language arts to sixth grade. They're looking at me like this is boring stuff. So I thought, okay, let's really break it apart. Let's frame it. What's the motive behind somebody using a particular word choice? What would be the impact of a particular word choice that was used? So this way I got my students to really interact with it. When I read these, I could tell whether my students actually understood or did not understand the um, content. Um, this is another just a graphic of showing you what a frame looks like. Oops. Oh, well, this one shows you the same thing, um, but it layers instead of each corner being all depth and complexity, you could add anything you want to as far as how you're interacting with the text. Um, This is, again, as the year went on and my students were more and more comfortable with the prompts, instead of just asking one prompt at a time, I wanted to increase the rigor that I was asking of them, making them think even harder, as it were. So then I would say, okay, now we're grappling with two prompts in each section. So you're utilizing two. And typically, I would give them three of the sections. I would tell them they had to do these prompts. I would leave one, one area of the frame open for choice. Um, something that they'd like to do. Typically our gate students, well I shouldn't say typically, but a lot of gate students will pick the easier route and so I would guarantee, oh no, you're going to higher level thinking because you're going to look at the impact of the ethical situations here and you're going to look at the parallels of the big idea. So you can guide what your students are learning and really differentiate whole class this way. You could have everybody doing ancient Kush in the middle, how they're addressing ancient Kush, you can individualize with what prompts you're doing. Um, again, this is something that they're not going to be able to just copy from the book. They have to think, they have to understand this information. Um, a lot of times I would use these in place of a test. If you didn't, we didn't want to do a test, I would do this because this really shows me if a student's understand or not understand. Um, so this is a book review from Aya Malala. They read the book and instead of just writing a book report, they did a frame on the story. And again, they're using multiple perspective, uh, multiple uh, prompts to um, interact with the text. And again, uh, this one was obviously science biodiversity, looking at multiple, uh, not multiple perspectives, but looking at the double, prompts getting to the higher levels of rigor. I mean, you could easily just talk about what's the big idea of biodiversity. 
you know, um, but by asking, what's the big idea by telling me, I want you to look at the details and how those details lead you in to that big idea. What's particular about that language, you know, that you can talk about biodiversity. So anything that you pick and choose within the frames, it's up to your choice or even your student's choice. I love doing a frame in math. Um, in math, especially with Common Core saying that we really need to have an understanding of mathematics, not just can I do an algorithm and can I get the right numbers involved, but what is my understanding of mathematics? And I, this was a homework assignment one day. I just said, okay, I don't know how well, I was kind of like feeling out my class, almost could be a formative assessment. What do you really understand about rates, ratios, and proportions? Can you write this information and tell me what you know? And I was pleasantly surprised to see that, yes, most of them did know it. But it's a, it's a great way of getting information for you and for them to kind of finalize and formalize their thought processes on a subject matter. This is something, um, it's great. It's David Chung, who's out of Placentia, Yorba Linda. And unfortunately, I look at the bottom of the graphic, it's kind of, you can kind of see his name at the bottom. But he has things online that are open and available to anybody. If you type in literature circles with depth and complexity, his work will pop up. Um, he does a lot of stuff specifically with certain kinds of um, gifted strategies, like the Think Like a Disciplinarian within book reports, or just a basic literature circle with, with frames. Um, he is a high school teacher. Um, I've had it for like five years thinking I would change it, modify it, tweak it down for my sixth grade level. I ended up never doing that. I just gave it to them as is, and they were able to deal with it fine. There wasn't a problem with that. It was nice um, to see what they're capable of doing. So that's another way to utilize the prompts on a regular basis. Again, this is a test because weathering and soil, I'm sorry, I, I don't know if anybody's a real science fan out there, but getting weathering and soil as an exciting topic for sixth graders was not my forte. So in this instance, I had them, this was their assessment. Um, do they really know information? And again, they really have to understand the subject matter in order to complete a frame, at least to the level that I would expect of them. Um, this is my favorite trick, and I learned this at a conference I went to one time. Instead of having to run off a frame or worrying about, you know, did I print it, did I not print it, this is a super simple way. You're teaching a lesson and you want to see how things are going, or you're teaching a lesson and you think they're ready for it, just quick, grab a piece of paper, fold it into quarters, just in a, in folded. In the corner where it's all folded, you fold that down into a triangle shape, open it up. In the center of the triangle is your content. Then you have the four areas. Could be a homework assignment. There you go. So here we are. Who created democracy? Answer with the thinking prompts. So again, another kind of a simple fun tool that you can utilize in a classroom. Um, my school was a thinking map school, and within thinking maps, there's a lot of areas that overlap really with depth and complexity if you think about it. And Pinterest is a wonderful thing. And I found the um, image on the right hand side of the screen from Pinterest, the one that has the main idea, shows you all the prompts that would go with it, the thinking map. The one on the left is one I did in my classroom. Um, so looking at the big idea was every discipline is connected to another to provide meaning, looking at two different um, uh, religions and compare from that and looking at the props. So again, another way to add more rigor to even a thinking map. This, um, I had a teacher, she did not have Gates students in her classroom. She actually had the lower, the RSP group, but she did interactive notebooks, and within her interactive notebook, she was still referring to prompts every day in her classroom with the students. Like I said, it's good for everybody. So the big idea was the objective in this matter. The language was the language of mathematics. So just another example of how you could interact with the prompts in a classroom. But again, all this is based on the fact that you are dealing with prompts on a daily basis. So any product that you do, instead of just asking the who, what, when, where, why, how, 
extend those questions and instead of asking who, ask, you know, what was the motive behind the individuals? What's the impact? What are the rules? Um, get into higher level thinking in anything that you're doing. So you can see here, this is just an example on my wall. And again, the prompts were everywhere. Um, this is something that I found, I don't even know where I found this. I think I got it at a CAG conference one time, but I thought it was pretty ideal for upper grade um, middle school, how to write a thesis and how to make it even better with the overlap of a content of a prompt. So this one, system of oppressions, looking at changes over time to elevate your, um, the idea of just a thesis. Um, when I first introduced the prompts in my classroom, I usually use the story of Goldilocks and the three bears. And I go through just a quick, here's Goldilocks and the three bears. And then I look at all the prompts in relation to the story of Goldilocks. Um, the last couple of years, I've been doing the same thing with the giving tree. The chart that you see is my students after going through, this was their reaction to what they had seen um, in the giving tree with relationships to the prompts. Um, the other one is another, it's a video that we watched and how do the prompts overlap in that. So Dr. Kaplan would tell you to introduce the prompts in a step-by-step, step, very structured model, which is wonderful. Um, I found that I did not have enough time to do that and, and thoroughly teach all the prompts. I would never get around to anything. So I just started using them, talking about them at the very beginning, um, and I throw them all out there. I introduce everything all at once. And then every time, because they're on my whiteboard, because I interact with them, every time I talk about, say, the ethics, I would pull the ethics prompt down and talk about what, what is ethics, the right or wrong, you know, pull down the rules prompt when I'm talking about rules. So it's very interactive and ongoing. Um, children tend to pick it up that way. The older students you have, the easier it is for them to, to pick up because they understand the meaning of the words, the academic language. Younger kids, it's more of a process of explaining what these things are. Um, this is just another example of how you could use depth and complexity in the physical structure of the prompt itself. Um, leading up to, this could be your writing process, your, your rough draft, your outline. Here's my big idea. These are my supporting things. That could be your body paragraphs. Um, this is, like I said, Pinterest is my best friend, I think. I spend a lot of ridiculous amount of time on that website, but they have a lot of fun stuff and a lot of it's free. So you can go on Pinterest, Teachers Pay Teachers, just type in depth and complexity prompts, and a lot of stuff comes up. Now, I don't guarantee the quality of anything that's out there, but it's just fun to see how other teachers are utilizing the prompts within their classroom, what they have available. Um, it, a lot of times it just helps spark ideas for you. Um, this was a science unit. It was a science assessment that I did for my students. They didn't want to take a test. So I said, great, I'm going to give you this anyway. Uh, they didn't realize that they were doing a lot more work with this. But it's one of those, um, these are the directions. And then this next slide shows you what it actually looks like. So it was four little squares, it's just a piece of paper folded into fours. So it looks really small. But then you overlap it and it made this big 12-sided paper, both sides. So my kids were interacting. A test would have been a lot easier, but they wanted to do this. I prefer this because the content that I was getting from them was uh, much greater. And this was all on the atmosphere. So I think they know more about the atmosphere than they ever probably thought they would just based on this one activity. Um, this is another um, way, again, oops, let me go back to that one. The, any, if you're using any of the, the activities that you do in your classroom, just make sure that when you're doing them, put in those prompts. So when I'm asking you to respond, write an essay, um, if, I, if I write a test and the test has essay questions, put prompts within your essay questions. Elevate what you already have. Um, if you're interacting with them daily, they will start utilizing them daily, which is which is what you want. They want you want them to internalize what all this is. Uh, again, more stuff that I found 
this is from the Envision website. They have a lot of wonderful material out there that's available for free as well. So to get some more ideas on how you might start this. Uh, um, depth and complexity with close reads. To me, these were just meant for each other. If you think about when we're teaching a close read to a student, the first time you're reading it, just for the gist. Well, the gist really is you're looking at the details of it. You're looking at what the story is about, right? Um, you may even be looking at a big idea. But then I'm going to ask you to go back through, and the next time you read it, let's read it for um, the low. Is my audio off? I've got a signal on my screen. Nope. We still ha we still hear you loud and clear. Okay. I've got to. Um, so if I'm doing, um, if I want to go through and read that that same article again, but let's read it looking, do you see any motives involved here? Do you see anything happening? Do you see an impact of what's going on? What proof do you have? So as you extend each time you read the close reading, ask them to look at a different prompt. This is an area where you could do this in um, like a jigsaw in your classroom where we read the whole article just to get the gist. So we read the whole article really just looking at the details, the big idea of what the story's about. And then I can go back and say, okay, this group of students will read it looking specifically for these props and another student, another set of props and go through the class that way. Um, you could even scaffold it to the point that if you have kids in your class that are not going to be able to grapple with the higher level as well, you could give them some more prompts that are more readily available, more understandable. But do this on the same reading, come back together and share out all the information. It's amazing what you can gather from one article. And this really targets the students um, learning how they're, how they're looking at information. So instead of just telling them, read it again for what do you see the next time, read it again, what do you see next time, this really focuses what their learning is. So it's, I, to me, they're ideal look at using uh, depth and complexity with close reads. Okay. And I can't get my screen to move again. There we go. Um, so bottom line, what I want you to get out of this all together before I get to the questions is really you just need to be utilizing the prompts all the time every day. If you can figure out a way to get the prompts out where they're accessible to you, whether you buy the prompts, whether you make the magnets yourself, um, use them and get them out there for your students. You're teaching them how to think and remind them all the time that this is how you think. How do you think about, you know, learning new information? What do you need to know when you learn in, in new information? You need to look at the details of information. You need to know what the big idea is that you're learning. Um, there's probably a particular language within that discipline that you have to know. So all of this is basically what we do as teachers, what we try to do as teachers. But now we're asking you to say, wait a minute, call it out as a specific item of itself. This is a language of the discipline. Every discipline of study has a particular language. If you understand the nuances of each language, you're better able to understand whatever the subject matter is. So just making sure that you're doing that all the time with your kids will help. Um, with that, I think I'll open it up to the questions and see what we have. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Krista. And for all yeah. of you who are logged in, Krista, if you want to take a moment to go ahead and glance sure. over at your chat panel to see if any questions had come in while you were presenting. And for those of you who are logged in, if you do have a question for Krista, please feel free to submit them in the chat panel at this time. Um, and I'll let you, I'll give you a, a minute or two to just glance over there. I saw a couple come yeah. in. Yeah. Yeah, um, some um, asking the newer prompts. The newer prompts came out of another Javits grant that Dr. Kaplan did and her interactions with students. And she works primarily with uh, primary age children. And she said that just in conversations with them, she's, she saw that they were trying to grapple with judgments and motives. So she made that a concrete thing that way. So that's where they came from. Um, the thinking tools, 
the our labeled whiteboard magnets are labeled whiteboard magnets available for the new thinking tools? No, and they won't be because this is um, Dr. Kaplan's work, um, and she does not um, believe in making a profit off of it. I guess is the way to say it. Um, so they're out there for your use, but she's not going to sell them to you. So what you can do is what I did is I just took the prompts, the new prompts. And actually, if you email Lisa and she can email myself, I'll send you um, a sheet with the new prompts that are already the size of a magnet, the same size as the other magnets that you can buy that you can make yourself. And that'll help. Um, and do I introduce, I do introduce the prompts all at once. Um, I know some people are more comfortable with grade levels. We introduce these, the next grade level adds more. It's up to you. But I found that with dealing with students from kindergarten all the way through to high school, they're able to comprehend all of them and utilize them. Some you'll probably use more often than others, but that's your discretion as well. Um, the idea really is just to use them and use them on a regular basis, whether you're just using three or four of them or not, that's fine. So, do the students memorize them? They memorize them through usage. The more you use them, you can also give them, there's like a little sheet that tells you, here's the prompt, this is what it means, kind of thing. So I think my time is up. On that, so we, if, we might if I have, have yeah, any other questions, time for one more, one or two more questions. If any of you logged in, still have a a question regarding anything Krista covered. Okay. It looks and like again, a, lot a of copy, questions are repetitive. Yeah, a recording of this webinar will be um, sent out again, so all of you will be able to rewatch it and see if there's any resources that you yeah. didn't have a chance to jot down while we were doing it live today. And that site, somebody asked about the site that I referenced, it is Envision, which is a wonderful site, it has a lot of things out there. So, and again, there's a lot of good stuff out there on the internet. If you just type in in a Google search, depth and complexity, you'll find quite a few things out there. Um, and again, with anything that's on the internet, take it um, with a grain of salt and look at it and see ways you can improve it. Or if it's perfect the way it is, just go ahead and utilize it. Um, teachers are the big ad, um, saying don't have to reinvent the wheel if you don't have to. Um, there's a lot of free resources available to you. Great. Thank you so much, Krista, for sharing all of okay. your knowledge with us on the strategies to use the prompts um, to incorporate higher level thinking across subject areas. If any of you have any questions, if you think of one later tonight um, or in a few days, feel free to send me an email. My email address is listed on this slide, and I would be happy to forward it on uh, to Krista for her response. And hopefully all of you will um, join us next week on the same day and time. We're going to finish out our series with backwards planning, the cure for procrastination. So if you haven't already, please register for the webinar by visiting the link on this slide. And then also, if you're interested in earning credit for the webinar series, please feel free to contact me. Thank you again so much, Krista. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you.